I want to be a great personal trainer. I want to be a great sports coach. I want to be a great strength and conditioning coach. And that's what I hear a lot from students who come to Max and they want to be great at what they want to do. Now, that's a great goal because, hey, time's going to pass you anyway. The next 5, 10, 20 years are going to pass you by doing what you're doing. And the question is, by the end of it, are you going to be great or are you going to be average? And my goal is to make my graduates great at what they do and get them all the tools, the hard skills and the soft skills to do that. And there's an old saying, people don't care how much they, you know until they know how much you care. So today we're going to be focusing on a bit more of the soft skills rather than the hard skills that's going to make you a great personal trainer or coach. The hard skills being the physical things that you have to do, the running, the push-ups, the skills, the passing the ball, the kicking the ball, the punching the bag, the swimming. They're all the hard skills and the structure of the program. The soft skills are the things that get into your your um, uh, your athletes or your clients' mind and make them want to do that and do it to their best. And your role is to bring the best out of people. And I'm going to go through some tools and some things that could be beneficial to you to bring the best. Because if you can bring the best out of them, you can bring more out of them that they think they've got, that they've got in them, then they're going to keep coming back to you because you're the person who does that or brings the best out of them. Because the body will only follow where the mind will allow it. And your goal is to open up their mind uh, to help them bring out their best physical performance to achieve their best goals. Whether that be losing weight or rehabilitating an injury or winning an Olympic gold medal. Now, I've been in this fitness profession, the sporting industry. I've been in sporting or since I was 10 years of age. So now that's, what, 46 years I've been a competitive athlete starting at 10 years of age. In judo at the elite level, I've always competed at national and international level, winning many national championships and world championships along the way in my chosen sport being martial arts and kickboxing and taekwondo and judo and all of that. But I've also played lots of team sports such as cricket and football, so I understand that dynamic. So I've been doing this a long time and I've been a professional coach, a professional trainer, a professional personal exercise coach since I was 17 years of age. So now that's coming on 39 years as a personal trainer, as a sports and conditioning coach. And one of my early passions was strength and conditioning elite athletes. And in that journey, I've trained many Olympians. One, I've, I've trained Olympian gold medalists. I've trained uh, Olympic teams, international world champions, national teams along the way. And in that journey, I've made lots of successes, but also they've been many times founded on many of the mistakes uh, that I've made along the way because I didn't have someone like me around me to mentor and coach me through that process because a lot of the things... Uh, we knew I was the first, one of the first strength and conditioning coaches in Australia. I was one of the first personal trainers in Australia. So there's no one else to learn off. I was sort of pioneering my way through and learning from making mistakes, doing it again, making mistakes, and keep doing it until I get it right. I virtually went out of mistakes and eventually got it right and achieved lots of great things uh, along the way. But one of the great rules is learn uh, from the mistakes of others because you won't live, live long enough to make them all your own. So I'm going to share some of those things with you today to you know, help you become the best personal trainer, whether you be working in a gym or running your own gym or your own studio center or being the best coach for a sporting team or the best strength and conditioning coach. Now there's no saying it's important to practice what you preach, you know, walk the talk, and I feel that's a very, very important. So if you're a coach or a personal trainer, then you have to be living what people want. You have to have what they want so they're inspired to get what you have. You know, so if you have what they want, they want to come to you to get that. So that's not just historically, if you're a past champion or a past sports sports person or you used to, it's in the now, you know, you may not be as young as you used to be, but it's important that you still walk in the talk, you're taking action and being the best you can be, and that's going to be provide a great role model, because people will uh, watch more than what you do than what you say, you know, they won't hear what you say from who you are. So one of the things when I was younger as a strength and conditioning coach, I was training uh, the national kayak team, we are training for the Olympia, Olympic Games, I've trained lots of different athletes, but at that same time as a coach, I myself, I was still a professional kickboxer, still competing, and that gave me a lot of cred points uh, with the athletes that I was training. They were quite inspired that I was actually practicing 
what I'm telling them to do. And many times I'll train with them, I'll outrun them, I'll outperform them, not all the time, because I've trained some quite an amazing international, international level athletes, but there was that mutual respect that they got from me, uh, that they looked at me from, because I was actually a competitive athlete. And that's not to say that you have to be a competitive athlete, but you, you at least have to be training, you have to be practicing what you're preaching. You can't be what we call a hypocrite. You know, a lot of people say far more than what they know and far more than what they've done. But if you've done it, then people are going to respect that in, in itself. And that's not to say that you come across coach, coaches who may be out of shape or haven't done it for a while and they still have great advice, but it really goes an extra, extra step if you're actually running around the paddock with them uh, and showing that you can do it themselves. One of my good friends, uh, Wayne Pierce, we call him Junior Pierce, he's one of the great Australian Rugby League legends of the time. Uh, he captained Australia, he was the New South Wales State of Origin, he was the first coach uh, to coach New South Wales to a clean sweep in the state of origin. And one of the things I've always respected with him is that he's always fit, he's always strong, he doesn't become one of those overweight coaches sitting on the sideline looking like they're going to have a heart attack coaching. He can actually get out there and run with the, with the guys and perform with the guys and that game, game gave him a lot of respect from his players as well. So my suggestion for what it's worth is that you at least practice what you preach. I still compete now in the international stage in my sport, martial arts and taekwondo, and I still coach uh, martial artists and competitors. And them knowing me competing really sort of makes him feel, well, man, if he can do it, so can I. If he believes in me, then he must know because he's act actually doing it. I remember in 2019 at the World Taekwondo Championships in Melbourne, there was, I had uh, four competitors and myself, and we all medaled, you know, we won a, 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 about seven gold medals at the World Championships, and I collected two of the gold medals. So I was there coaching them, pushing them, motivating them, stuff like that, and then later on the day, they see me on the mat doing what I'm telling them to do. I'm fighting on the mat, uh, winning a gold medal. Uh, so that in itself says, says a lot, and you tend to get a lot of cred points uh, with that. Not that, that you have to do that, but at least be fit, healthy, strong, because nothing is interesting more than seeing a coach who's really overweight, even if they used to be an elite, elite sports person back in their day, you start to think, well, what happened? You know, where to go wrong when you, when you retire from your sport? So at least stay fit, healthy, strong, so that way you're still practicing what you're preaching, and that gives you what I call integrity and that's I found that very beneficial in my in my uh, yeah I'm still coaching people to this day I have a, a, a team of uh, martial artists uh, my uh, overall um, uh, martial art club you know we've won uh, close to 50 gold medals in world championships with five world champions collecting those gold medals so you know we have a very elite group of uh, competitors we all compete together, we all practice together, we all train together, and I'm not going to be the hypocrite to tell them to do what I haven't done or what I'm not doing. So whether you're a personal trainer, a sports coach, a strength and conditioning coach, uh, make sure that you're walking the talk and not being a hypocrite and your words come out with integrity because they come from a, a great place. So number one, uh, be what you want your athletes to be and you find that they'll be quite inspired by that. The other thing is obviously you yourself will have lots of great experience because uh, otherwise you won't be the coach. You've probably been an athlete in your time or in, the, in a sporting team in your time or you yourself from a personal trainer, you've gone through your own journey. You maybe have lost the weight yourself that inspired you to become a personal trainer. So that in itself says, hey, that, that's credibility. You know, you've been overweight, now you're fit, healthy and strong, now you're helping other people lose that weight or you've been injured. I say sometimes when I get students who are injured, they overcome injuries. I said, this is gonna make you a great trainer because you're going through what you're gonna be helping some of your clients to go through is the rehabilitation of injuries and you're going to understand the emotions they go through, the frustrations they go through, the pain that they go through to get those injuries right. I, me being a sports person, I've had injuries so when I come across athletes I, who are injured then I can empathise with them and I can connect with them because I've been there whether it be yeah, at the moment I've got a bit of sacroiliac inflammation in my lower back, whether it be patellar femoral syndrome in the knee or shoulder impingement uh, in the shoulder or arthritis in the heel or whether it might be plantar fasciitis in, in the foot. 
or whatever it might be, uh, you know, if you've gone through them yourself and you've rehabilitated yourself, that's going, that's going to make you a better coach, it's going to make you a better trainer. Because again, you've been through the high points, but you've also been through the low points. So when you go through those low points, enjoy the grind. Say, this is conditioning me to make me a better person, a better coach, uh, a better athlete, because I'm going, and a lot of athletes and people will go through those little obstacles. And if you can go through them, then that's going to help you help others go through their own obstacles. And yes, it's going to be different and they're going to get, they're different, but there's some form of connection there. So see it as a positive, your past experiences of successes, but also your past experiences of uh, failures or challenges or injuries or setbacks. Uh, you know, I have won a lot of world championships. I won 25 world taekwondo championships and numerous world martial arts championships. But that, but people don't understand. I've also lost a lot too. I've lost a lot of fights. You know, I've been through championships where I haven't won any medals. So therefore, I can understand the two sides of the coin. You know, the the celebration and also the disappointment. And if you go through that, you can use that energy of the disappointment to put into your discipline of training so you can get the celebration again. If you've gone through that, you can help other people turn them, lift their spirits, encourage them to go again. Because I always say to my, my, uh, my, my, my um, athletes and my clients, if, if you train enough and you become good enough and you compete enough, you will win enough. You won't win every time, but you will win enough and sometimes you don't win when you expect to win and sometimes you win when you don't expect to win well that's just the beauty of life isn't it you know, if you're having to go having to go having to go because a big shot is a little shot who keeps shooting so number two is that yes yeah you use your own experience and if you haven't got experience then it's best you get experience you know if, the next one is to acquire massive amounts of knowledge now yes you need the knowledge of the hard skills how to train people and the hard skills and the technicalities of communication and motivation and all sorts of stuff there but I'm, I'm talking about knowledge from other people who have achieved great things and one of the things I do, I like to study excellence. I like to study greatness. So whether it be studying a great athlete or studying a great coach or studying a great business person or studying a great religious leader or politician, if anyone's done anything great, I like to study because success and greatness leaves clues and those clues are in the journey and the story of other people. So I've read great books of the great coaches like Phil Jackson who has a great book called 11 Rings because he won 11 NBA championships, six with the uh, Chicago Bulls and five with the LA Lakers. Chicago Bulls with uh, Michael Jordan, LA Lakers with Kobe Bryant who's competed with two of the greatest basketballers of all time. And he's probably known as one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time and he's written a book about his journey. So why wouldn't you read that book? Yes, I don't train basketball, but it's coaching and motivating and being able to bring a team together, get the best of the team to win in such a competitive environment at the world stage. So if you read that, you're going to start to learn about his way of managing and motivating and connecting his athletes to bring the best out of them. And yes, well, you won't do it his way, but you can learn some clues that you can change and adapt it to your way. Uh, Alex Ferguson has written uh, the book on, on winning, which is basically you know, Alex Ferguson, the greatest soccer coach of all time, uh, with the uh, Manchester United, and he's written a great book on, uh, on winning and coaching, and uh, I've read that naturally, because why would I want to learn from his experience uh, as well? So uh, the book by Wayne Bennett, he's written a book on you know, the greatest rugby league coach of all time. So my point being, make sure you study not just the theory of coaching and the theory of uh, motivation but actually I like to read the uh, autobiographies of the bi authorised biographies of great coaches who've written about their life and then you can get it from the horse's mouth not just in a hypothetical uh, template or a, a pie chart or the, the different theories they have in the academic books. I like to learn from the people who have done it for real on the ground in the trenches and most of these people have written uh, great books or great books about their journey uh, and they're there for you to learn from. So yes, you're learning from your own experience but learn knowledge from other people's experiences and other great coaches. And if you take that into place, you're going to take bits and pieces, you're going to work out how to do it yourself. So yes, all of this to start with is all about you. A, yourself and your actions, to have integrity, to be walking the, uh, walk the talk, uh, to be the real deal that you're practicing what you're preaching. Number two is learning 
uh, from your own experiences, from an athlete, from a sports person, whether it be in your own journey for fitness or weight loss or performance or whatever it might be, uh, your own experiences, whether you're your business coach. Yes, I've got uh, you know, academic qualifications in business, but I've been in business for 32 years and I've had 15 different businesses and some of them have been multi-million dollar businesses and some of them have not been so successful even though I've enjoyed them just as much. So there's lots of business failure and lots of business success. So yes, you walk the talk. A, you have your own uh, experience uh, in studying uh, your past and learning from your own lessons. And the third one is learning from other people. And again, if it's in business, there are lots of businesses, uh, great entrepreneurs who've written books, whether it be Steve Jobs or Richard Branson or it be Warren Buffett. They've all written Warren Buffett and Snowball, Losing Your Virginia and Richard Branson, uh, Steve Jobs and, and, and Apple. So yeah, they've all written books. Another piece of great book just behind me, I just noticed before, but lots of books here. Is uh, obviously Jim Collins is studying other great books, but uh, other great businesses. But Howard Schwartz is on is the creator of Starbucks. So learn from other great coaches, or business owners, or personal trainers. Now, the next uh, soft skills, which is really cool, so that's all about you. You know, who are you becoming? Because the first part of sales, if you understand sales, the first thing that people buy is they buy you. <laughs> then the next thing they buy is your reputation or your brand. And the third thing is they buy your skill or your product or your service. But they have to buy you first. So you are a walking billboard of your business and everything you do counts. Everything you do either builds your character or deteriorates your character. Build your reputation or deteriorate your reputation. So it's really important that you work on you, and if you work on you, then you can help other people. You know, Jim Rohn, my great business philosophy is learn to work on you yourself, learn to work more on yourself than you do on your job or your occupation, and then you be more valuable in your job or your occupation. And what you do in your own time determines how valuable you become in other people's time. So the next, the next step is about your, uh, your client, your athlete, uh, your sports person. Now, now it's about them and it's your ability to use all that experience that you've got and be able to connect with them and seek to understand them before they seeking to be understood, which is one of the habits and the seven habits of highly effective people. Seek to understand before to be understood. So when you're training a, a, an athlete, everybody's different. Everyone's, everyone has a different life, different circumstances, different emotions, different history. So it's really important that you first to find out about them. And we use this in the program in the W questions. Now, the first question, uh, the first W question is the what, but I have a one before that, which is the who. So when you come across a new athlete or a new client, then find out about them. Who are they and you know, what do they do? And you know, find out about their personality and their history and tell me about you. And the more you find out, the more they're gonna share uh, clues of those little nice little trigger points that you can press because some people in life are motivated by pain, avoidance of pain, and some are motivated by the uh, 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 seeking of pleasure. Some people are motivated by a fear of losing versus the joy of winning. And you've got to work out with each individual of what are their motivators, what are their, their go-to buttons, what are the things that get them going. And find out about them as much as you can, not just about their sport or their fitness goals or their sporting goals, but just them as a human being, as a fellow part of the community, find out about them. Because if you care about them, you find out about them, you're going to know how to connect with them and move their, their mind and their emotions so their body and their drive changes with it. So the first is the who. Next is the what. What is your goals? So it's important to find out, you know, and when you look at goals, we look at, you know, I look at short-term, medium-term, long-term goals. So if it's a sports person, what are your immediate goals? What do you win? It might be, I want to win a national championship. If it's someone like, oh, I want to lose 15 kilo, okay? That's an immediate goal. That's something which you can take action on now. So find out what is there. Short-term goals. Now, normally I say short-term goals is something which is within 12 months or so, maybe one to two years. That's a short-term goal because, you know, you want to take action now on that to achieve that in that six months, 12 months, 18 months, whatever it might be. Then the next one is what is your medium-term goal? Now, that could be two years plus. So your short-term goal might be able to, my goal this year is to make the Australian team or make the national team or just make the team. That could be my goal. 
My medium goal is to uh, be the key player on that team and to win a, a premiership. <laughs> And then the long-term goal is I want to go down as the greatest player in that sport, in the history of sports, or I want that team to win more premierships than any other team. And that's more long-term goal. I want to become one of the legends or one of the Hall of Famers. That's long-term. So what is it your, your client's short-term goal? It might be I want to lose 15 kilos. My medium-term goal is that I want to be able to maintain that and to become a trainer to help other people. And my long-term goal is to live a life up to 100 years, being fit, healthy, strong, helping lots of people, running a business, whatever it might be. So when you actually ask goals uh, of your athletes, not just restricted to what the immediate one, because that's just a stepping stone to there uh, of the short term. That's a stepping stone to the medium to the long term. It's quite amazing that I've had coaches in the past, and many times they haven't even asked me what my goal is. They just assume uh, what it is. And so they just go around and they treat everyone pretty much the same. And it's all really up to the individual athlete to motivate themselves to crystallize their dreams in their own mind and to act on them. And there's a coach who just directs you and takes you to the team or takes you to the, the football field or the swimming pool or what it might be. It's quite amazing how many coaches don't really know the details of a person, let, let alone the the, the very specific details of their goals, whether it be short term, medium term, or long term. So if you want to be the extra mile coach to go into that category of greatness, A, find out about the person, B, find out the details of their goals, their short term, their medium term, and their long term, and then you're going to have a clear picture and a path to create a path for them to uh, go down to achieve them and build the stepping stones to achieve that. The other aspects of this is it's just, you know, you find the what, what do you want to achieve, but the really important is why do you want to achieve it? Find out what the why makes them buy. So find out what is the emotional drivers of why they want to make the team, win the premiership, get the gold medal, win the world championship, lose the 15 kilos, get stronger, put on muscle. Why do you want to do that? What, what is the, how is it going to affect your life? And how is it going to benefit your life? Not just from a physical point of view, not just from getting the medal, but having the medal, how would that change your life? How would that make you feel? And that's really, really important. I remember training with one of the young up-and-coming fighters here in New Zealand, and we're doing a very hard training session. And I said, so why are you doing this? You know, what, what are you driving, what's driving you to win this gold medal? And he says, my family. You know, because he's Marty, uh, his coach was Marty, and his family is everything. Because it wasn't about him, it's about I want to make my family proud. So when I trained him, uh, I was using his family, thinking of your family. One of my fellow colleagues in kickboxing, professional kickboxer, uh, he ended up winning three world championships. And his driving factor, he's so motivated by his father. And uh, his father was ill, and he was fighting for a world championship, and he just took a real beating in one of the rounds and he went back to the corner and his coach, who's a great coach, says, think of your father, do it for your father. And he just got up and just, you know, he got fire, fire in his eyes and went out there and ended up winning the championship. Because the coach just used the right words and the right reason, the right why to really fire them up. You know, so sometimes, you know, sometimes it's not just about me being selfish winning a gold medal, it means I want to do it for my family, or I want to do it for another external reason, or sometimes an internal reason. So what's really important as a coach, as a personal trainer, is find the details of the why. What is the emotional drivers? What, what are the words that you can use to fire them up and get them going? And obviously you want to find out where they want to achieve those goals, where they want to lose the weight, or where they want to build the muscle, or where where the World Championships are, where the Olympics are. Obviously this year it's in uh, Japan, that's the where, and the, and the last is the when. When do you want to achieve it? And you attach all of those W components to the short-term goal, the medium-term goal, and the long-term goal. When I first got back into martial arts and I hadn't competed in World Taekwondo Championships, even though I had competed in International uh, Kickboxing Championships, you know, I started back in 2012, and my goal initially, my short-term short -term goal, is I just wanted to be competitive in the world stage. I wanted to be competitive and be in the medal, medal running. My first year back into martial arts, I won the silver medal. My next medium-term goal then was I win a, win a gold medal. And then I wanted to keep, my goal then is to compete every single year and to medal every single year in the world championships. And in that journey, I've won now 25 uh, gold medals and well over 40 uh, medals overall. They didn't happen because they happened because 
I planned it that way. I set up a goal, I set up a standard, I set up a routine every year if I compete in at least two World Championships every year, World Cup and World Championships, if I train to the level that I can, then I'm going to be in the running, I'm going to be in, the, in that medal count. I remember the greatest uh, swimmer in the Olympian of all time, Michael Phelps, who's won more Olympic gold medals than any swimmer and any athlete in any sports person in Olympic history. Uh, his coach, I read his book, it's a fantastic book as well uh, by him and his coach. And his coach said with him, "Is my job is to make you good enough so that you're going to be in that top 5% of the swimmers. You're going to be in the medal racing. You're going to be that good. No matter what happens, you're going to be that good. You're going to be in that group. Your job is on the day to make that medal of gold. Because on the day, the, those swimmers are so close, it's that person who wants it the most the one who's going to drive it the most, to have the biggest reason to win, to bring out what's in them, which they didn't think was in them to do that. And that's where the why is so important. And as a coach, sometimes you're going to use that why uh, to motivate uh, your athlete or your client in the competition or during the competition when they need it the, the most. Maybe they have a knockdown or they're behind or in between rounds. Those words of encouragement and attached to the why can really fire someone up to pull out uh, something which they didn't think they had. And you heard a bit of a shake then because that's my little baby Brutus. He's my assistant coach. He's here with me today. So those W questions, and obviously you can extend that to, you know, imagine that's happened, how you feel if you achieve it and how you feel if you don't. If you keep doing what you're doing now, are you going to achieve it by the timeline? What are you prepared to do to achieve it? So it's really important that as a coach you get their commitment. What are they prepared to do? What are they prepared to commit to? Because you have to make sure it's a two relationship. You know, you both have to commit 100%. I always say, if you're 100% in, I'm 100% in. But if you're only 99% in, I'm 100% out. Because you're giving yourself that 1% to quit, to give up, and to fail. And for me, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this together to 100%. But you have to be committed first. And then, what do you want from me? What do you want from me as your high performance coach to put you in a position where you're going to be the best you can be to make that team, to win that medal, uh, to lose that weight, to rehabilitate the injury, whatever it might be. So these are the communication skills that are really, really important in working with your clients. And it's also important to find out why, why they haven't achieved it yet. What are the barriers or obstacles in the past that stopped them from achieving it? Because history does tend to repeat itself. Why have you given up before or why have you not achieved it? So you may have to address maybe some fallback defaults that they have when the going gets tough, they may crumble. So he says, okay, so if that's happened before, is this, is this going to happen again? And how can you make sure that that doesn't happen again? So this is the ins and outs of the soft skills of communication to build a relationship, to seek to understand uh, what drives your athlete or your client or your sports person so you can get the best out of them. Not just the best out of them when they're at the top, but also the best out of them when they're actually falling so you know how to get them back up again. So use those communication techniques, the W questions. I'm not going to go any more detail than that, but we do go far more in detail in the program uh, on how to, because of every question, you should have at least three sub-questions attached to it to gather more deeper information about the answer. So listen to the answer and dig deeper. The other aspect, sometimes an athlete doesn't fully understand their potential. I've had uh, people join me uh, in martial arts, and within about two sessions I've said, I can make you a world champion. And because they don't believe in themselves, because they don't know what I know, they haven't been where I've been, so therefore they can't see what I see. And I can see filaments and greatments of greatness in people. And I said, look, I know with that skill or that technique or your, you know, whether it be skill or whether it be talent or whether it be just drive or whether their attitude, I can see that where I can get them. And the five world champions I've produced on day one or day two, I've always said to them, if you keep training with me, I'll make you a world champion. And they didn't believe it. They said, oh, well, what are you talking about? I've just had my second session. You're already talking world championship. And the reason for that, because I've been where they are, and I've trained people where they are, and I've taken them from where they are to where they want to be. So sometimes the, uh, the most powerful thing you can do to an athlete is give them hope and encouragement uh, and to say, you know, you can do this, because many times they can't believe it. They have that seed of doubt whether they're good enough, and your role is to... You know, to give them that confidence. And I always say the best way to overcome lack of belief is sometimes it's important to believe in other people's belief in you until you have built your own belief in you. And that is the role of the coach. 
if your athlete doesn't believe, then it's your role to make them believe that you believe in them, that they can achieve that. And that's going to keep them on the path because they will keep on and say, well, if my coach says I can do it, then I can do it. If my personal trainer says I can do it, then I can do it. Because they've never been that damn path. They haven't journeyed that far. So they don't really know how good they are or how good they can be. And a great coach will be able to see that and to encourage them to, to, to get onto that path and to be uh, that guide, you know, to, to put them back on the path, knock them back on when they get off. And sometimes you have to reprimand people and you have to give them strong feed forward. And many times I've done that too because their behaviours have not been congruent with the champion. And many times I've had to pull an athlete, a, 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 a athlete across or one of our clients across and you know, give them the hard line of the truth. And because they trust me, they said, yep, fair enough, thank you, because they say things or do things out of character of being a champion. Because you really have to develop that champion mindset to think like a champion to become a champion. So be before you are and you become. It's a goal, goal is important for when they're training to train as if you're the world champion. Train as the person you want to be, not the person you want to become. Train the person you want to be, not who you are. So I always say, when you throw a kick, throw a world champion kick. If you do a performance, do a gold medal performance in training all the time, and then that will build the character, and eventually the medal will match the performance. So yes, as a coach, it's important to get involved uh, in and and also know what what, what your 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 clients are doing. Um, you know, unfortunately, I've had coaches in the past who've trained me, and uh, for world championships or international championships. And they've trained me and I've paid them to train me and then they found out I've won a, a world championship and they found out by a post I put on, on Facebook uh, or on social media and they go, oh, congratulations. And I forgot your world championship was then because they are more involved in the training and the transaction of training but not really being fully involved in my dream. And as a trainer, as a trainer or a coach, you want to be fully involved. You should know where the championships are. You should actually be there. Rory shares this great story when she received a phone call from one of her personal training clients. He said, oh, Rory, just, uh, just thought I'd give you a call. I just finished the half marathon. You know, that was my goal. She said, oh, congratulations. And she beat herself up after that saying, well, I should have been there. Why did I forget that I've been training my client for a half marathon? They ran the half marathon. I forgot they ran the half marathon and I found out by them calling me. Well, that is not acceptable as a great coach. But we all make mistakes, and I've done that in the past as well. But, yes, yeah, very interesting when, you know, your coach finds out you've just won the gold medal um, after you won the gold medal in a different country and you didn't realise you went in the same country. That in itself says, well, maybe they're not really interested in me. They're more interested in the status of being the coach or interested in the money of making from the coach or the or more interested in the training of being a coach, but not necessarily interested in the dream. So as a coach, you have to invest your whole self. Actually, the importance of them achieving their dreams and goals should be so important. It's almost as more important than you as it is to them. I get more nervous uh, coaching my, my, uh, my fighters in the championship than I do about competing in my own championship. When I was in Melbourne with fighting, it was the first time I've actually fought with all of my, my fighters with me fighting, because normally I'll go solo to these championships. And uh, yes, I had my events on, but I wasn't even thinking about them. I'm just trying to get medals for my, for, for, for my fighters. And if I came out empty-handed, I would have been happy. Because when you're more interested in them winning medals than you winning medals, is, that's when you know that you're a great coach. Because you put their interest far before your own, because that's what you're there for, is to get them to win medals. And look, I've won plenty of medals. So yes, you know, them winning medals is more important uh, than me medic, uh, winning medals because that's what a great coach does. That's what's so important is that you get great satisfaction. And I get more ner nervous watching my fighters fight than me being out there fighting uh, myself. So that's really important as your job is being the best out of them and get them winning as much as they possibly can. It's interesting of recently we've been in the last year and a half of COVID lockdown so therefore we haven't had any face-to-face -face fighting and a lot of martial art clubs and fighters and coaches they've actually done nothing over the last year and a half but what's interesting is my club and my fighters we've actually collected uh, well over a dozen world championship medals online now 
just because there's no face-to-face -face competitions, I need to still need to keep them motivated, keep them training, give them a reason to train so they don't collapse in that time of uh, no man's land during the COVID experience. So the first thing I did during the COVID is I started seeking other competitions for them to compete in. Yes, they can't do the fist-to-face, the fighting, but they can do what we call patterns or carters or forms in martial arts so they can keep training. And uh, last year in 2020, we collected a whole bunch of world championship medals all of us, and I just got a whole new batch that came yesterday from uh, another organization who ran a world championship, and we collected a whole big bag full of medals again, and every time I say, hey guy, we've got another competition, there's another one coming up, I was talking to one of my uh, my clients or my athletes just the other day, she says, there's another championship, an open world championship, do you want to go? She says, yes, let's do it. So it gives them something to train for, even though they haven't got the face-to-face -face contact. So your role as a coach is, is not to be a victim as they are when, when, when there's no competition and it's been cancelled. Hey, what can I do to keep them motivated? Because athletes are goal-seeking machines. They want to have something to train for. If they don't have something to train for, they probably sit on the couch eating chips, watching Netflix, getting fat. And before you know it, when the face-to-face -face competition comes back, they have to you know, have a big uh, uh, rebound and they have to have a comeback. But if you keep them competing, uh, last year we competed in about four different international championships. This year we've already competed in two because my role as a coach is not just to uh, wait for the face-to-face -face competitions but to seek uh, goals and medals and achievements for them to keep training for so they keep achieving because they're going to be great memories they have when they look back and say, hey, during the COVID time when everyone else was sitting on their hands, I was using my hands to keep fit, healthy and strong, competing and, and winning medals. So a coach isn't always just there uh, to support them in the obvious goals, but sometimes you actually have to come up with goals for them, which they didn't even know that was there, to keep them interested, to keep them inspired, to keep them training, to keep them achieving, to keep them sharp. So when those other goals come back into play, then they're ready to go. Because success happens when preparation meets opportunity. So there are some key things, the soft skills of coaches, and I didn't go into the training and how many push-ups to do and how many punches to do and how many laps to do. But you know, what's really important is that you know you you are involved emotionally and physically. You know, if they if you if you if you get your athletes and you say do 10 laps but you can't even run one lap, then there's a challenge there, right? Uh, so you want to be in the mix. You, you don't want to be on the sidelines telling people what to do even though you're not doing it or you haven't done it in a hundred years and it looks like right now that if you did it you have a heart attack, that's not very inspiring. So be that person that people want to be, be that person that people are, are, are inspired by, be the role model, uh, get involved, get involved, invest in the dream, know the ins and outs, know the personality of your athletes and your clients, know what their goals are, their short, their medium, their long term, know all the underlying reasons for those goals, the why and the where and the when, and, and know what the barriers are so you know how to overcome those barriers and know what the words to say when they need that little word, word of encouragement to get it back in there and, or to recover from whatever it might be or lift them up because you know your role is to lift people up and raise them and get them on your shoulders so they can see further than you've ever, ever seen. And if you do that and if you invest that uh, with the hard skills that you already have, because obviously coaches have the hard skills because they've already been athletes or they've done courses or whatever it might be, and you self-educate yourself in the academic way, but also mostly from people who've done it, then you're going to become a great coach or trainer. <laughs>